you can't have economic development without uh, proper telecommunications. And now, today, in this world we live in, you can't have further economic development without broadband. When we came to PNG in 2006, on my first visit, you know, we realized that PNG had virtually no telecommunications at all. So it was a matter of providing that mobile communications to everybody in a ubiquitous way. And that was, it was all very well saying that at the time, but to do it, it was like, oh my God. Brown flower, here we go. Tea Yes, so the Irish love their bread and uh, they love wholemeal bread, brown bread. Here's the flour mixed with uh, salt and sugar. Oh, come on. Whoops. Oh, there's enough lemon juice in there. Of course, you can't use the wooden spoon anymore. That wooden spoon is okay to get it. Uh, up to this kind of humbly stage. So this now is going to be a loaf of Irish bread. Well, brown bread anyway. Now when I go home, I will go down to a little village on the banks of the Shannon River called Carragahort, and I will eat a bowl of fresh mussels. They'll be opened probably in white wine, a sprinkle of lemon juice over them, lashings of Imelda's brown bread and a pint of Guinness to wash it all down. I've got to stop talking like that or I'll start crying. It's a, it's a story not very well told because if you take missionaries that came to Papua New Guinea here over the last hundred years, many of those missionaries went on to educate people and it wasn't just about spreading the word of whatever their God was because, you know, the key thing if you wanted to have a developed country is educating people. I did not enjoy my primary school days. I was educated by the Christian brothers, and they were very tough. They believed that you could not teach boys unless there was an element of fear at work. And so they were very quick to use the strap and the cane uh, to beat uh, their kids. I never forgot that, and I certainly remembered it when I was a teacher. And I was determined that when my kids came into my classroom, they were looking forward to being there. I, I wanted my classes to have an element of fun and excitement and adventure in them. Uh, Marco, do you want to come in and look at some of these photos? I'm trying to figure out what year is that? 
Would I be one year old or not one year yet? That's me with the golden curls, and that's my big brother. Wow, my new brother was so elegant. He looks like a gardener. <laughs> so. Are you listening, Mom? <laughs> The west coast of Ireland is heavily indented. You have these great peninsulas sticking out into the ocean. So I grew up on a little little town there. And um, in, in the winter time, it's, it's just incredible, these mountainous waves that come rolling in out of the ocean. And from time to time, you get a real super storm. It was absolutely fantastic. It was just a uh, part of history. And uh, we knew that our people had been starved to death um, and uh, by the English. As we, we, we didn't say the British, we said the English. We knew that the wealth of the country was being exported while people were dying by the, by the roadside with their mouths full of nettles or grass or whatever they're trying to eat. We knew that. Ireland was losing its young people at the rate of 50 to 60,000 a year. And according to one of the Irish newspapers I looked up this morning on the internet, the population is now officially 5.1 million. Yeah, the highest it's been since 1851. Reminding people of today who read today's newspaper, reminding them of the famine years, the years of the great hunger, of what happened, reminding them of the emigration from Ireland. We don't forget. And, and, and sometimes these things seem as if they just happened last week. tiny island of New Ireland in the South Pacific, a day of great ceremonial is getting underway. Here, 12,000 miles and half a lifetime away from his home in Ireland, John Glynn is priest, teacher and tribal chief. Somebody sent me a DVD of uh, a story of an Irish priest called Father John Glynn, who lived in New Ireland, probably 30 years ago on it. I watched this DVD, I thought it was remarkable because here was a priest from County Clare in Ireland and, you know, working in the community, but what he was trying to do was to keep their traditions up. And obviously he was spreading Christianity as well. What influenced me more than anything else, I suppose, was watching the missionaries and seeing what the missionaries were doing. I was deeply impressed, tremendous men and women having this wonderful quality that I admire in anybody, that when a, a challenge or a problem arises, you respond to it eagerly. It doesn't frighten you, you don't run away. Missionaries are a dying breed, unfortunately, because of the lack of vocations in the church. With faith in God, I, John Glynn, speak the truth. I respect other people's property. I am gentle in my actions and in my words. I repay my debts. I keep my promises. May I be committed to honesty, integrity, and good citizenship all the days of my life. 
I was always fascinated by the Gospels, the stories of Jesus and how he related to people and especially how he taught. His teaching methods were incredible. I mean, parables, obviously, but also the way he, as little as possible, did he condemn, criticize. Uh, always his, his message was positive. It was do rather than don't. Can, can I say a few words to the class? Okay. Okay. Morning, everybody. Morning. I, uh, I apologize for interrupting your class. How are you all doing? What are you doing anyway? What? What's that all about? Parts of speech. Oh, parts of speech. Oh, grammar. Oh, I hate grammar. <laughs> Everybody hates grammar. Well, grammar seems terribly boring. It, it really seems terribly boring. The thing is that if you know your grammar, it means that when you are writing in English, you can come across with great clarity. And there can be no mistaking um, the meaning of the words you use. When Father John had come to and he had made the case to our chairman at that time that uh, the school was experiencing um, huge levels of overcrowding, we saw it as an opportunity to begin working on a partnership with an urban school because uh, the fact that 60% of the population, or so thereabouts, below the age of 15, it's a time bomb if we're not able to create opportunities for them. <laughs> My name is Bernadette Ove, and as of last year, the year 2020, concluded my 42 years of teaching in the schools in Papua New Guinea. Since the first four deal of the brothers from Australia came up here. In the year 2018, all the schools in Port Mosby, the primary schools did very well at the graded national exams, and there was a big majority of students that were eligible to continue to grade nine and we had uh, almost over 400 students to enroll in grade nine and we had basically only four classrooms. Just four classrooms. It caught the attention of the YESO Foundation, I think, through Father John Glynn. Allow them to be able to see what overcrowdedness is like in classrooms. According to um, the education, national education plan from 2015, I think, to 2019, the teacher-student ratio should be one is to 50. We have more than 50 students in our class, as far as maybe 80, 85. Even in this school? Even in this school. Like currently in, 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 in the school, I have more than 67, 60 students in our this class. Is, so what are we looking at? This is the, this is the new uh, classroom building. Yeah, we've built a number of schools and a number of projects here in Port Moresby, but that was, you know I mean, just too easy. So we decided to go all over Papua New Guinea and develop projects in conjunction with local community leaders. Out and you try and name this structure. And it then get involved in issues that were kind of touchy issues that multinationals wouldn't got involved in. For example, in domestic violence, the treatment of women. Um, and we decided that we would take some risks in that area, even if it was detrimental, possibly in the short term interests of our business here. because there's a little girl in here who is uh, severely disabled and is normally left entirely on her own in this little house. Now we can't get in because the door is locked and nobody has a key. This is a open one door. Now a little woman and she's lying. Oh. The other one is there. It's too dark in there. Uh, what a name from Figurini, Maria, Mary. Joyce. Joyce. Unable to protect herself, Joyce has been abused by men in the settlement, leaving her parents no choice but to lock her up when they leave for work. Joyce, you're looking doctor some of the time or not? No doctor. Oh, well, that's something we have to 
That's something we have to arrange. Father John, he's heavily involved in the community and it's the people that are really at the lowest ebb of the economic cycle and social cycle. He is doing what social services in Europe would normally do. and There's no social services of that kind of nature here and in the Pacific region. So, you know, but there's lots of other people doing incredible work here. Name like you and they also have made a big impact. Ah, okay. Emmy Long, but any Emmy Stab Long School. We were blessed when we had Father John Glynn coming on board in the year 2002 because he brought that spiritual aspect and blended it into all, everything that we were doing in the school. And the parents were quite happy because if you look at that way, you will see there's an abandoned building that is incomplete from the Department of Education. All the schools in Port Mosby have them. We're now approaching a classroom block yes. that uh, was part of a, a scheme. I don't know the full details of it. And um, the Education Department began building classrooms, blocks like this one and also teachers' houses and other accommodation. This building got to this stage, and then everything came to a dead stop. In 2011, or was it in 2012, I can't remember so many years ago now, there was an, there was an assumption of about 300 million kina that was available from the Department of Education to be able to put up infrastructure in all the primary and secondary schools here in Port Mosby. So they went ahead and signed, you know, paid documents, I think, rushed documents that were signed. And then the contractors went ahead and started. And then they were waiting for the funding to come from the Department of Education and no funding came. Those contractors that had sufficient money were able to continue, but those that did not, they stopped the projects. And, and that's 2011-12 and this is now 2021. This is uh, typical of a number of cases around Port Moresby in schools and um, the trouble is nothing is ever resolved and nobody says how do we go back to identify precisely what happened, where the money went and who is accountable. There has been a great deal of development in Papua New Guinea since independence. Um, the areas in which there hasn't been good development are the ones that occupy us. But for me, as a teacher or being involved in one way or another in education all these years, that to me is uh, the saddest part, that we have not developed universal primary education. Everybody in the nation, literate and numerate. Children who are actually on the streets, where should they be right now? They should be in the classrooms. What is the reason for them being not in the classrooms and selling things on the streets instead? True. Maybe one of the reasons is the parents cannot afford to meet the, 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 the little fees or the fees that are charged on um, by schools to allow for children to be in, in school. Or they probably are orphans who have been maybe left behind by parents who probably have passed on and they live with relatives who, le who care very little about them, making them then live out in the streets to fend for themselves, well, they should really be in the classrooms. Education is still nowhere near free. I, the, the free tuition plan of the government, it, it's really more about politics than it is about education. What we want to do is to have a debate. How do you find your education? I mean, um, I think 75% is it, tuition from the government and maybe 25% from the family. But um, there are all the extra costs. And one of the big ones, of course, is transport. It's, it's getting to school. Because when the children are allocated to the different schools, not much attention is paid 
to the distance the children have to travel to get to school. There is a girl who lives at 17 miles. So she comes here every day. So they wake up at about five, four, five in the morning. They have to leave the house to walk up to the nearest bus stop. The mother, they catch a bus, they come to Gordon's, and from Gordon's they catch a cab. They catch a cab. And the mother literally brings the daughter every single day. Every single afternoon she finishes work, she comes to the school, picks her daughter up, they go to the bus stop. If they have to catch a cab, if they're running late, they catch a cab and they go, go home. This is part of Papua New Guinea growing up. Uh, Papua New Guinea still has a long way to go. This is a huge challenge for Papua New Guinea that people don't discuss and are not even aware of. The need for a sense of national identity. What does it mean to be a Papua New Guinean? Coming up in the next episode of Leave No One Behind. Yes, we are going to Chinatown. In the back of Chinatown, there is uh, the second oldest settlement in Le. It's called Bumbu Settlement. The biggest problem in this community is law and order. Drug issue in this community, alcohol issues in this community. Most people in Le City don't want to come to this settlement.